Hey everybody, my name is Tyler Lay, and in this video, I'm gonna do something a little bit different. We're gonna interview another concrete freakian out there, right? And we're going to get into some of their favorite things about concrete and some advice for people that are in the concrete industry. And I hope you like this video. It's a different type of thing. If you do, be sure to give me a comment encourage me that goes a long way and let me know other people that you would like to see me interview in the future this is something i'd like to continue doing so let's jump in john belkowitz is the chief technical officer for intelligent concrete john is an amazing amazing person very very fired up very inspirational and extremely involved in social media. John did his bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the Colorado School of Mines, his master's degrees in material science from the University of Denver, and a PhD in mechanical engineering from Stevens Institute of Technology. The dude is extremely diverse and he is obsessed with colloidal silica as well as other things in concrete. He also kind of looks like a mad scientist and kind of acts like one sometimes as well. John was also in the United States Air Force from 1996 till 2004. He was in Africa, Saudi Arabia, South Korea, and Germany. He's been extremely involved in the American Concrete Institute, especially in their nanotechnology committees. John's dream is to become a superhero of concrete, and I think he's almost there, if not exceeded that. I hope you like this interview. Let me know. John, thank you so much for being here today with us. This is one of our first interviews where we're doing with people in the concrete industry, and I'm super duper excited to have you here with us. I'm gonna ask you a series of questions. I want you to do your best to answer them and be kind of rapid fire and fun. And again, um, if uh, something comes up that uh, you wanna change or, or you wanna revisit a question later, no big deal, that'll be totally awesome. So the first question I wanna ask you is, Tell me about an unusual habit or absurd thing that you love besides concrete. Because I know I know you're a concrete freak, but what else do you love out there? Um, so we live out here in the country, and I um, one of the absurd things I love doing, my wife loves wildflowers. So this time of year when we get a lot of these lightning, hailstorms, rainstorms, I'll run out to the pasture and I'm known as that crazy guy who runs out to the pasture to start throwing wildflower seeds because the best time to plant those wildflower seeds in the open pasture is like the last snowstorm slash hailstorm where the seeds can actually crack under that freezing you know, snow or hail. So I guess that's one of the absurd things that I love doing. But it's for my wife, so it's not too crazy. It's like romantic crazy. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's love right there, right? Um, going out in the rain, throwing out wildflower seeds. So what's the next one here? Uh, next question is, how would you describe yourself to other people? So if somebody doesn't know you, they don't know you, they don't know anything about you, what is something that you would use to describe yourself and kind of what you're all about? Right, um, so my mom calls me the perpetual student. Um, I'm always reading a book that might not have to deal with concrete, but it always goes back to concrete. So I, I am a perpetual student who has fallen in love with concrete. And um, another way that I like describing myself, one of the things that I love describing about concrete is the, the backbone, sorry, the backbone of concrete strength, the calcium silicate hydrate. And I call it the superhero of concrete strength. And I, I really like that description. And I also love the calcium silicate hydrate too. So I feel like I am the calcium silicate hydrate of concrete. So I am a concrete superhero, just like you are. Oh man, that's awesome. You know, it's funny because I was actually gonna ask you what your favorite hydration product would be. And I, I think I already figured out what it is. I think it's CSH, right? Yeah, and you know, I'm I'm not of the mindset inner product is better than outer product. I, I actually love all calcium silicate hydrates, whether it's made by tri-calcium or di-calcium silicate or pozzolanica action. So. I don't hate, I love all calcium silica hydrate. That's cool, we're all about love here as well. That's cool. So you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you're um, a student of concrete. I think that that's totally awesome. But tell us where you fit at in the world of concrete. Where, what are your kind of ex expertise and what um, do you do for the world of concrete? 
So um, I act as uh, a concrete material scientist. There really is no such... I mean, there is a title, I think, as a concrete engineer, but when you go for the PE exam, they don't have concrete engineer as one of the selections. So I'm more of a material scientist, and I work for a larger company called Intelligent Concrete, where we specialize in making concrete do the impossible, making your concrete stronger and last longer is our mission statement. And we work with a group of people who does just that. You know, there are some new and amazing technologies that are sometimes lost in a university basement or even some uh, small business. We help either bring those technologies to fruition or help bring them to the industry through technical transfer. Um, and how it all started for me, and I'll, I'll throw two more, three more sentences out there. I started out helping mom and dad pay for rent as a mucker's apprentice. So I would bring, you know, tools out to the job site, get coffees going. In the middle of the day, I was lucky if I got to do some finishing. At the end of the day, I would clean up tools and boots, and I'd bring beers out. Um, but it wasn't until I got into the military that I started being trusted with concrete mix design, and I fell in love with it. Uh, so with that, plus the experience at university I had, I always tried to make concrete better, to make it stronger and last longer. And again, going back to it, it's why I feel like I'm a concrete superhero. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. So where did you get your obsession for concrete? Was it, was it in the military or was it before that? And um, thanks again for your service, by the way. But um, where, where, where did you become obsessed? Where did you get the bug? like the, the disease of love and concrete. So it's, it's a funny story. And, you know, my background, concrete has been in my life since I was about 14 years old. And it was, you know, a, a way to make money, a very good way to make money, especially for being a young kid. And getting into the military, uh, I was part of the civil engineering squadron, so it just happened that way. Um, when I went, so I always had concrete in my life. It's the strangest thing. You know, there's a book by Earl J. Hadley. It was written in 1947, and it talks about how when American an American opens their eyes in the morning, all they see and all they do has something to do with concrete. And that's what my life has been like. It wasn't until I was at the Air Force Academy, I had uh, been doing a, a steel structures class, and I didn't do very well. It wasn't concrete, so I didn't care. Um, so I had to do some extra credit, and I was, I was a big guy at the time. And my, my, uh, my uh, not my guidance counselor, but the, my, the officer who was watching over me, who, you know, in, in the uh, civil engineering department, um, I needed some extra credit work. So he said, well, we've got this concrete canoe competition. He goes, we need somebody to row a boat. Do you know how to row a boat? I said, well, I've rowed canoes in the past, so I can row a canoe. And he goes, that's great, because we made a concrete canoe. And it was called the POS. The pride of service, and it was this big, heavy canoe. I mean, just terribly splat. They did some Jackson Pollock splatter paint because it was just terrible. Um, so I, that's all I had to do: eat steak, drink beer, and row a canoe, and um, or paddle a canoe, whatever it is. So I, uh, I remember I went to the competition. It was in um, Wyoming, and um, I did not have to do the presentation stand by the canoe. I knew nothing about it. So I was walking around the other canoes, and there was another team. I walked up, and this canoe, Tyler, this canoe looked like, I mean, it was just, it looked like a Chevy from 19, I mean, from the 1950s, just beautiful, gorgeous, just, like, and I said to the team, I was like, this is a beautiful canoe. This is gorgeous. And one kid looked at me, and he goes, F you, you know, gave me the finger. And when I was a younger man, I got... What? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was a younger man. I used to lose my cool. So I took the canoe. I said, oh. you know, I'm not going to say the cuss word. I said, F me, F you. I took the canoe and I threw it. And that canoe, like, you know, didn't flip, but it rolled over. And I tell you, it was light as all outdoors. It didn't break. Nothing happened to it. But I started going wow. after them. So our advisor for the team yanked me by my ear and threw me into the government van, and he said, if you're going to beat them, you're going to beat them at their own game. And he threw a concrete producer magazine at me. I read that magazine cover to cover about somewhere between five and ten times, and that's when the fever started. I came back that next year as the captain for the concrete canoe team. There were times that they locked me out of the uh, concrete lab. 
I used to break in, as an Air Force cadet, I used to break into the concrete lab to do concrete mixes just to get a one. That year we went back to the concrete canoe competition is when they changed the rules to, you know, it only could be like a nine-page paper, and then you had to do some type of a flag. And that's when the first year that they really, like, had a major change. I ended up getting that same de- team disqualified. So that was, you know, I got rewarded. We didn't place first. We placed second. It was just, oh, it was a great year. It was a great year, and that's why That's I cool, man. That, that's a cool story. Yeah, and, and I guess it's just been growing and growing ever since then for you. Well, yeah, I, I have kept something with me. So that that one competition where we lost not only in rowing and I had to give a competition the comp- or, or I had to give a presentation. Presentation was hilarious, but it was wrong. Um, I wanted to keep a memory of that competition. So I took a piece of concrete from our canoe that ended up breaking. And I've been doing that since that competition is carrying a lucky piece of concrete with me everywhere I go, so... Uh, no, that's a really cool story. Thanks, man. Thanks. Uh, next, time I, next time we see each other, you're, I'm going to have to figure out which uh, lucky piece of concrete you actually have with you, and you can tell me the story behind it. It'll be, it'll be cool. Awesome. So what is an area in the concrete industry that you think we need to totally reinvent? I mean, what do you think is just stuck in the past and just needs to change, needs like a game changer? What do you think? I'm very passionate about this. Um, there's a question that I often get asked, um, and it, it deals with Elon Musk, Richard Branson, you know, these hyperloops, these cars that drive themselves. You know, the question that I often get asked is, what is concrete 2030 going to look like? Yeah. And, I mean, you know, if you look at the different universities from all over the world and just some of the pioneering engineers or even just scientists, there's a lot of great concrete ideas that are coming out there. Um, But I think it's the answer or how we answer that question that we need to reinvent. And I'm not trying to sit around the campfire here, um, but it needs to be a global industry effort where it's not just the academic arena, it's not just the engineering community, the architects, it has to be the contractors. Everybody who's involved in ACI 132R, you know, uh, uh, ACI 318, you know, making concrete gray and coming down the chute to the contractor who gets off the job site at 4.30 in the afternoon, we have to reinvent how we answer that question because the answer yeah. to that question is harsh. By the time we get to concrete 2030, we're still going to be paying for concrete 1999, concrete 2005. I just got finished giving a presentation in, um, in Sydney, Australia, and I was able to ask everybody in the audience one question, and that was how are they doing on their uh, repair and replacement budgets? And these are all municipality folks. And the range was, I'm short 10 to 30% every single year. Now, these are people who live in an island, and they make durability and innovative decisions more so than we do here in the States. And that... What does the ASCE say? We have a, t- a D plus on our civil infrastructure rating, something to that effect? That's right. There are some very cool things that we can do if we can get to concrete 2030. But the major change that we need to answering that question is twofold. Getting us to concrete 2030, and that's reinventing how we see durability, how we take care of durability, what we rely on to meet the ongoing demand of concrete construction in place structures, but still reaching that 100-year service life. Yeah, I agree. The second piece of that, sorry, I, I'm almost done here. The second piece of that is what do we do once we get to concrete 30? Besides making durable, awesome concrete that's stronger and lasts longer, I think the next thing that we need to do when we get to concrete 2030 is energy harvesting concrete. Twofold. Yeah. I think it's got a really, really uh, cool idea. So I'm going to ask you specifics now. So how are you going to make this super durable concrete? Or in your mind, what do you think is one path forward to do that? Is, are we going to already do the stuff we already know? Is there something that we're missing that we need to unlock? What do you think, what do you think is the key to get there? Specifics. You know, Katie Bardage and her group wrote a paper back in 2009 talking about, you know, how ASR is getting worse. And the, the unfortunate reality, I spoke about the harsh reality before, the unfortunate reality is, 
is that we're dealing in a much harsher environment. Either it's more traffic, more people, more uh, reactive cements, more reactive aggregate, what, if it, naturally occurring or manifested by us. Um, our concrete is not lasting longer. So the things that we need to do, again, need to be twofold. It needs to be new concrete going in, down the chute, you know, that we use new and emerging technologies, everything from colloidal silica to carbon nanotubes to alternative supplementary cementitious materials. A lot of these concrete technologies aren't used to replace what we're currently doing. I didn't say replace Portland cement. I actually love Portland cement besides it being, you know, hailed as the worst thing since, you know, cancer. Um, but uh, they're wrong. They're wrong. They're wrong. If it's you, awesome. If you, right, look, go ahead. if you look at the alternatives, that being said, we still need to use our cement, our cementitious materials more efficient, efficiently. And that unfortunate reality is the mature technologies that you and I had, you know, silos of when we were kids, the fly ashes, the, the choice class F fly ash that was a little bit beige, didn't smell like ammonia, and it made that concrete creamy and dreamy and eat. We don't have that anymore, at least not here in the Western yeah. U.S. And if we do, it's, it's a little bit here and there. We just can't rely on those technologies like we used to. We have to be comfortable really breaking out of the surly bonds of what we're used to throughout every piece of the chain of command or our global concrete effort, making, placing, engineering it, formulate it, so on and so forth. We need to start becoming more comfortable, and that's with things like colloidal silica, ASCMs, carbon nanotubes, those things that we're not used to using. And there's just so much data out there and so much been done that we really have no choice at this point. No, no, man. That, that's a good answer. So I'm going to you, – you brought up a lot of great technologies there, and I'm going to ask you uh, about a short definition of each one, and, and just short. So colloidal silica, tell people – what colloidal, what colloidal silica is in two to three sentences, what it's all about. You know, as, as a parent, you're not supposed to have a favorite child. So when, ah. it, when it comes to concrete technology, you're not supposed to have a favorite technology. I have a favorite concrete technology, and it is colloidal silica. And well, dude, you have been an innovator. You have been a leader in colloidal silica ever since I ever heard the word colloidal silica. So... I mean, I'm super excited to hear what you have to say here because you this is this has kind of been something that you led the charge on. So keep going. Right, and it was it was back when I was a younger man when I had a full head of hair that I, I fell in love with colloidal silica. And to give you a very basic definition, it's a colloidal or milk is a colloidal suspension of proteins and fats. So colloidal is just a universal suspension. So colloidal silica yeah. is a universal suspension of nano silica particles, anywhere between one in 100 nanometers. Um, why, why are they, why is that a game changer for concrete? Why, why is that such a big deal? There is no better way of saying it than a game changer. And the true name that was coined by Brian Green, and you know Brian Green, from the U.S. Army Corps yep. of Engineers in, Miss, in Vicksburg, Mississippi, was an ultra-fine amorphous colloidal silica. And that right there, even though it's a mouthful, he called it the UFAX, even though it's a mouthful, it, it kind of tells you why. That reactive silica that is not on such a small scale that it's a solute in solution that normally has to be carried by a lot of salt, like your silicates, your potassium, your sodium silicates, those are good. We've been using those since the 70s to densify slabs and for other things, but they carry so much salt with them, then those salts can often cause a problem with concrete, especially the potassiums, right? With colloidal silica, we're actually dealing with a hardened particle that's using orders of magnitude less salt to keep that thing in suspension, yet we have a very reactive particle. And with that reactivity, especially since we can control the growth, what's on the particle, and the different amount of particles in suspension to get something like a gradation envelope like you would use with SCCs, with colloidal silica, we have the first time, in my opinion, in the concrete industry, the ability to affect effectively manipulate the molecular kinetics of cement hydration to densify the porous sponge which makes up the hydrated matrix of our concrete composite. In doing that, I mean, that's at the root of making our concrete stronger and last longer, yet we still get that great concrete that comes down the chute, we finish up the slab, get off the job at 4.30 in the afternoon. That's why it is the next... So, 
fucking concrete. It sounds like to me, I mean, you can tell you're passionate about this. You can tell you know a ton about this. You've thought a lot about this. But it sounds like to me it's this additive. It's a, it's an additive. It just really has a game changer ability for concrete. That it really enables you to densify your structure and take things like calcium hydroxide, which we don't necessarily love about concrete, and then turn it into more to calcium silicate hydrate, the stuff that, like, is the great stuff. It's the stuff that, you know, makes it strong and makes it last long, as, as I heard you say earlier. Does that summarize it? The superhero of concrete strength. I mean, really, that's, that's what right. we're doing. We're, we're creating seeds for those super... And there's a wonderful paper that I, I encourage you to read. It's by Land et al. back in 2012, and he specifically talks about this seeding effect of calcium silicate hydrate uh, and it's it's a beautifully well written paper with wonderful illustrations in it. And there's some better authors out there, but really, I mean, what he does to describe what the colloidal silica can do for the hi- the the hydrating mechanisms, the the hydrated phases, and then just overall concrete is beautiful. Now, what I did is I built on the shoulders of giants, and I brought that to a practical level, and that's what we do. Colloidal silica is great. But if it's only great at an academic level, which for a very long time, colloidal silica has been around since the 1800s. You know, the first patent here right. in the U.S. was in 1959. If you drink beer, have ketchup on your fries, drink wine, you have colloidal silica. It's, it's a huge part of our lives. Um, with concrete, it actually started being used 20 years ago. It didn't start getting popular until about a decade ago. And that's when I came in, and my first job decade and a half ago was to figure out why colloidal silica was actually causing problems. Because just like polycarboxylate high-range water reducers, you can't close your eyes and throw it in the back of the truck. There's a process to using it. Definitely. So you kind of brought that to the practical side of the fence, made it uh, where people could use it in everyday concrete type stuff. Right. Gray concrete coming down the chute. That's important, man. Yeah, it is, totally. Was it this problems? Is that what got you started studying um, colloidal silica, or how did you how did you start doing it for the first time? What what kind of got you going? Um, so how did I begin? Uh, it's it's when I got to meet one of the coolest people in the concrete industry. But I was working at Lafarge here in Denver, Colorado, and that that's where I live in Colorado, and we were seeing the fly ash shortages, Class F fly ash, and especially like in Kremlin area. I had a lot of buddies living there making concrete out there, and getting aggregate up in the mountains is not an easy thing, so they were trying to use the locally sourced stuff, but that stuff, Tyler, that stuff is so reactive, it glows in the dark. Okay, it doesn't glow in the dark, but, but they were using like 30, 35% ash, and you know, according to our 1567s, and I'm not, I'm not trying to start the argument, which is better, the 1293 or the 1567, but that's what we use over right. here, and 35% wasn't mitigating and we saw that reflected and maybe it wasn't 35 it was 30 30 percent but we saw that reflected in the job sites you know in the so you were having horrible asr problems you were trying horrible. to stop it with fly ash and you just weren't able to it's like a runaway freight train and Is you that know kind of what's going on and yeah and then you know i have these pictures of fly ash that i can send you that some of it was struck match black and you know we, we wow. weren't even getting slumps you know we're supposed to get a four to a six and we're getting like a zero to a two and we had to like bump up the water. We had to, you know, juice up the air. You know, throw a little more high range because whatever was in that fly ash. And you know, there there are a bunch of people want to argue with me, but through the late 2000s, you know, 2005 time frame till right now, here in Colorado, New Mexico, Texas, Arizona, we've been having Nevada having a lot of problems getting Class F fly ash. And when we do. It's bottom of the barrel. And again, I'm not saying this is caused by the energy thing that, you know, NREL or, you know, there's plenty of flash in Chicago. We should have it here. However it's caused, that's just what we're dealing with. So I was dealing with that here in Colorado. I was, you know, we still had to have concrete go out the door. If we weren't getting ash, you know, you couldn't care. That, that's what we used to get from our, you know, providers that or our, our plant managers that we still had to, you know, make orders happen. So we were letting out straight cement mixes going out knowing well, full well the damage it could have done and sometimes we had to stop jobs so I was constantly looking for these different technologies and of course I met Rob Lewis with silica fume and then I started looking at lithium silicates and 
you know, uh, lithium hydroxides, and I came across colloidal silica, and it was the same time we had ACI back in 2006 in Denver. And I remember. I was there. It was a great, a, one of my favorite ACI conventions. And um, yeah. Brian Green was giving his presentation on ultrafine amorphous colloidal silica for a rock-matching grout. And, oh my gosh, I, I was awestruck by B Brian Green and his ability to give a presentation. And I sat in the front. You know, there's that teacher's triangle that, you know, if you sit in the front middle, you get the teacher's full attention. That is what I right. did. I sat up front. I was taking notes. Like, I just was enamored. And at the end of the show, I went up to Brian Green and I said, my name is John Belkowitz and I want to be your best friend. Um, so I, uh, I latched on to him. I mean, I latched on to him, his research, and then from him... I started, you know, he wanted to push me off on other people because I was very annoying. So uh, he started introducing me to the manufacturers of colloidal silica, and I, I lost it. Like I built a lab in my uh, apartment. I used one of Whitney's. Nice. Uh, I used Whitney's KitchenAid mixer. Uh, nice. Oh no, that was terrible. Oh, I got into so much trouble. She still reminds me of that. Still reminds <laughs> me of that. But I, that's when you know I had working for Lafarge was great. And I got to make a lot of amazing products. But it's when I got to colloidal silica that I felt like Richard P. Feynman. I felt like this, I, I felt it, like when I met Whitney and I fell in love with her at first sight, I felt it here with colloidal silica that this was going to change the industry and I was going to help that happen. Dude, you're still doing it, man. So keep up the good fight, man. Keep going and... And um, it's 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 breaking through. I can see it um, um, all over the place. And I, I know you've got a lot of a lot of resources on the on the web about it. And I'm going to give you a chance to talk about those coming up in just a second. Next question I have for you is: Is what advice would you give a smart, driven? Doesn't have to be young. Could be whatever. Just a smart, driven person that's either entering the concrete industry or in the concrete concrete industry. What what advice would you give them? And then. What advice should they ignore? What's the old thing people say all the time that you don't think is true? I mean, maybe it was true before, but it's not true anymore. What do you think? Um, so I, I, I just want to break apart your question right there. Um, I love the way that you use smart, driven person. Um, a lot of times when I get asked this question and, um, you know, I, I, I do have some letters after my name and sometimes – folks automatically say, what would you recommend for a college graduate? What would you recommend for a junior engineer or junior college? You know, and it's always kind of pigeonholing it. And, you know, I didn't come from university. Um, I was actually, you know, I went straight into the contracting world right out of high school, literally the day after high school ended. And well before that, I was always, just like you were, Tyler, I was a contractor first. And you know, felt the need to get into the science of it because I fell in love with concrete. But I love the idea of a smart, driven person because it doesn't pigeon pigeonhole us into academic background, age, nationality, male, female, wh whatever it is. The smart, driven person does assume something, though, and that's something that I won't talk about. And that's the hustle and the spree decor that that person should have. So that's one thing that I try not to do is talk to the other person because if you don't have the drive, you got to bring something to the table. So I do have some advice that people have given me, and then I have two things um, that I, I always add to it. Um, the first piece, and this is in no order, but the first piece of advice is from Mike Thomas. Um, years ago, and Mike Thomas, if, if for, for those listening, if you don't know who he is, you've got to look him up. Professor at University of New Brunswick. Am I saying that right, Tyler? That's right. And worked with the Federal Highway Association with Doug Hooten on ASR. I mean, just one of the most brilliant minds, in my opinion. And years ago, I, I was supposed to do, I wanted to do a PhD with him, but my dad ended up getting sick, and I, you know, went and decided to take care of dad to do my PhD in New Jersey, which I had a great time, but... I wanted to work for Mike, and I asked Mike, one day I want to be like you, Mike. I, I want to be at that top of the food chain, an influencer. What does it take? And Mike said three things, and, and this goes back to your question, what advice should you use and what advice should you ignore? Mike said three yep. things to me. First of all, 
whether you go into university or you stay in the operational world, you've got to work so hard. If you've got to love, love what you do. Work hard and love what you do. Whatever field you're in, the second thing that you need to do is find a specialty. Try not to be the renaissance man. Try to focus on something that you have that passion on, passion in, excuse me, that you're going to not have a problem working hard, loving what you do. So find that passion, find that niche, and put your head down and work so very hard. And, he, and those two I follow every day. The third That's thing, awesome. The third thing I don't agree with, and he said the third thing was have a British accent. Ah. <laughs> I don't. I disagree with that. Totally disagree with nice. that. Nice. Um, the second piece of, uh, of advice was from Brian Green, and I've already said it. Whatever you do, if it's not great concrete coming down the chute, and Brian will argue that's not him, that's somebody else, but Brian has his own twist and turn on it, just like I do. But if it's not great concrete coming down the chute, if it's impractical whether the scalability from the job site or to the job site or it just doesn't make the concrete creamy and dreamy it makes it sticky and nasty if it's not great concrete coming down the chute however cool your idea is whether it's glow-in-the-dark concrete blast absorbing concrete energy harvesting it doesn't matter how cool it will be it just it's not going to get very far in the larger industry doesn't mean it won't happen it's just you might not see it on every single job site. The third uh, piece of advice I got from a gentleman named uh, Rich, Richard Seishi, who is now the uh, chief operating officer at Charlie's Concrete, which is a concrete plant that produces somewhere around 1.4 million cubic yards. But years ago, and Rich has, I have a, you know, the front of many books of notes that Rich and I had conversations or Rich and I had conversations on, but one thing that I love that he says is that our job in the concrete industry is to go from bookcrete to labcrete to realcrete. And whether you're a student in university, whether you're on the job site as a, as a, as a tester, or you're driving in the truck, or you're plant operations, the infinite amount of possibilities in between, if you really want to add to the industry, you constantly have to be doing that. And if for some reason in your current position you can't do that and you want to do more, just like Tyler and I did, you've got to have the drive and the hustle to find the path to get you there. And there is a path. There is a path. Now, my two things that I take out of all of those three, and of course, you know, this, this comes from my upbringing, but no matter how smart or how dumb you think you are and you know the unfortunate reality and I love those phrases that a lot of folks in our industry who don't work on the academic side who work on the practical side who have a lot a lot to add to the industry they don't appreciate the knowledge that they're bringing and that knowledge means everything when it comes to innovative technologies without their knowledge we rarely can get good technical transfer that's why I'm so popular in the industry I can connect the academic to the real world, the bookcrete to the labcrete to the realcrete. But that takes hustle. It takes a lot of work. And some of that work is the second thing, which is if anybody ever tells you you can't do it, you're dumb, you're not smart enough. I once had an advisor at Colorado School of Mines tell me I wasn't going to be an engineer. And he just didn't say he, I wasn't going to be an engineer. He actually listed three reasons why I wasn't smart enough to be an engineer, to graduate from Colorado School of Mines. And when somebody tells you that, that tells you two things. One, you're doing right. But it also, it should be a bit of motivation. You know, I had a, a drill sergeant or a training instructor in the military who once told me that fear is the body's motivation for survival. So if somebody says that to you and it, it boils you up inside, um, use that as energy. Use that as almost like activation energy in concrete. Let it set off those reactions and instead of going to sleep, stay up a little bit later and read, you know, A.M. Neville's, you know, what is it, 13th edition on concrete. You know, there are so many amazing, read My one of them. book. Read one of Tyler's papers. Watch Cement Hydration Theater. That is one of the greatest 
YouTube videos in the flipping world. Thank you. Literally. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Man, and I knew you do. I knew you'd give a great answer to that. Uh, I know you're a, a passionate guy and done lots of amazing things. And I hope someday you reach out to that guy or girl, whomever it was, um, at uh, at at the Colorado School of Mines and let them know how you're doing. Because I think, I think um, they'd probably be surprised, but hopefully they're very proud because I, I, they should be. You're doing awesome stuff, man. Stuff, man. I actually keep it. So the next question is, what is something that you're excited about, that you're working on, that you can share with others? Just tell us about some of the cool stuff you're working on right now. And we don't have to go into like crazy, crazy detail. Um, I don't want to take up all your time, but just give us some tidbits. Give us some exciting stuff that you're working on. Sure. And, and at Talented Concrete, you do a lot of cool stuff. Um, this stuff is normally kept under confidentiality because we are working with formulas. But there are two things that I, I want to focus on. The first one is one of our sayings, one of our, you know, uh, our visions is that we're saving the world with all the concrete in it. And I do believe that we're concrete superheroes. And in that, we're working with a, con with a concrete company, a, a company that's trying to end homelessness from natural disasters using 3D printed concrete homes. That company's right. called uh, Icon, and we've been working with them, I think about a year now, um, you know, trying to uh, make their concrete stronger and last longer and also make it faster to print a home. And you can actually see some of their stuff online. There's a lot of YouTube or videos on YouTube, on Cheddar. And their mission and their vision is to literally end homelessness using 3D printed concrete structures. And they're actually doing it. They're going out to the middle of the world to put up 50 to 150 concrete homes um, to end homelessness this summer. So that's one project that I am very proud to be a part of. And the fact that it's innovative and we're doing 3D printing, oh my gosh. That in and of itself is just awesome. So that's one. Um, the other thing that I'm really proud to be part of is something that I'm doing for my seven-year-old son. Uh, it's called colloidal silica hydrogel technology. And it's something that um, I'm playing with the idea of going back to do a postdoctorate on. But at the very least right now, we've been working with clients who have been using that technology. And the reason why I think it is the evolutionary step, you know, with municipalities not having the money to rip out old concrete structures and put in new ones or even repair them, retrofitting concrete structures that need five to ten more years is so important. With a spray-on hydrogel technology, you can do that to a certain degree. So what we're doing here in the lab is... We're trying to tune those colloidal silica catal or catalyzed colloidal silica to react with the cement pour solution to seal and then heal concrete. So okay, so it's like a it's like a spray on um, colloidal silica material that helps harden the surface. Is that kind of how it works? Penetrates not just surface but subsurface, and if the structure has been cracked up enough, not to the point that concrete is falling off, but if there's enough pore structure that allows it, it can even go into the body of the concrete. It depends on how deteriorated the structure is, but yes. Now, you could mix that into concrete, but I really think deteriorated concrete structures where we want five, ten more years, that's really where it's going to help us out. Man, that's a really cool idea, man. I think that's really neat. That's really neat. Um, so is there any other projects you want to tell the audience about, or, or uh, should we move on to the last question? You know, there is one other thing. So we're also working on alternative supplementary cementitious materials. And this was ASTMC 1709. I don't know if you were part of it, but I know Doug Hooten was part of that ASTM. And if you haven't read it, it is one of the most practical ASTMs out there. And the reason why I love it so much is because of our fly ash issue. Colloidal silica is going to do some great things, but engineers are very comfortable using Class F fly ash and things that look like Class F fly ash. And with ASCMs, it gives us as engineers and material scientists that ability to replace those mature technologies that we're so used to with a certain amount of confidence. Colloidal silica is very, very new. ASCMs, it's an exciting 
innovative technology, but not that new. It's been around for a very long time, and we already have an ASTM, so it makes those engineers a little bit more confident when they have to make those trying a new technology decisions. That's cool, man. That's really exciting. I'm doing some work in that area too. Maybe we'll uh, talk offline about it some more, but I think that's, I, I'm right on with you. I think that's really important stuff and something that our industry, our industry is going to need big time coming up. So the last question, and this is, dude, this has been a blast, man. We got to do this again. This has been, dude, you're lively, man. I mean, I, I've seen you in person, but uh, you were fired up. I, um, I appreciate it. But um, last question is, where can people find more about you and what you're up to? So, like, hopefully there'll be some fans that people say, man, I want to learn more about John. I want to learn more about Intelligent Concrete, what they're all about. Where can they look you up? Where can they find you? And, and we are very active on social media. That's the best place to find us. Um, it was a little bit less than a year ago, so it was about 300 and 25 days ago that we started our one year vlogging challenge where we post an educational video every single day about concrete on our YouTube page. Um, so there's there's data, there's information coming out and we're, we're starting a segregation control project, a wildlife urban interface project, a thermal cracking project with slabs we're actually gonna forced to crack and we're going to measure the strain and the temperature that with a fast track pavement. So we're doing a lot of uh, projects that we're going to have online that we already have on our YouTube channel. And then there's always LinkedIn where we're posting either papers or videos or photos. And then of course, Facebook and Instagram. Again, we're active on most, if not all of the uh, social media platforms. And then when it comes down to it, my favorite place to go for conventions is ACI. There's not enough that I can say about ACI and what it has done for my career. So twice a year, unless, snow, unless there's a snowstorm in the spring, I'm at ACI giving a presentation, always willing to talk to somebody about concrete. And that's really where I'm at that I want to save the world with all the concrete in it. I do believe I am a concrete superhero. So if you ever have a concrete question, concrete concern, if I can't answer it, Tyler can answer it. But we're the, we're the ones to talk to. We're definitely the ones to talk to. Oh, man. That's awesome, John. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll get a um, list of your of your connections, you know, where – where, where we can find you and I'll, I'll link it in the notes and also if there's a video that you love that you just want to turn people on to and show people let's trade that offline too and I'll, I'll put it in the uh, video as well so people can see it and uh, everything else well I'll tell you this has been so much fun I, I hope everyone realizes that you just spent some time with the concrete superhero and John is doing amazing things and he's one of the exciting people in our industry and I'm so excited be able to do this interview with him so please make sure you check him out if you like this video please give me a thumbs up subscribe to my channel or think about leaving a comment below about stuff that you want to hear me talk about john talk about stuff you want to know about that's what this channel is all about giving people more information about concrete take care everybody bye bye